Welcome to the Kitsap Publishing Deep Dive Podcast with myself, Jack Bennett, and Emily Waters. Join us as we explore books, current events, history, politics, health, and more. Let's dive in. When we decide to create generational wealth, we need a value system and skills to enhance our legacy because vices make us blind, virtues make us see. Virtue, not wealth, is the goal of life. But wealth need not preclude virtue. What do I mean by this bold statement? My proposition is a simple one. Our pursuit of achieving wealth directly is rarely successful. Who does not wish to be wealthy? Yet so few are. The sheer desire for wealth leads many to undertake reckless behaviors or to look about for some never-failing guru who can turn a sow's ear into a silk purse by magic. By contrast, the great philosophers realize that what makes a person successful shows in every action and every endeavor. The pursuit of wealth that does not have the prerequisite character development usually ends in disaster. Either the expenditures will eat up savings before they can be usefully invested, or savings will be poorly invested and thus yield meager returns. The book before you will try to address in a systemic manner the logical steps and practical techniques of wealth creation. However, creating wealth is of little use if it is only a personal goal. The wealth that does not survive a single generation can hardly be called wealth at all. Wealth is, properly speaking, a means to ensure personal freedom. Wealth is a preventive measure to becoming co-opted by systems that will force us over time to sell ourselves, our talents, and our time for less than we deserve. The proof of this modern trend is that in post-recession America absent wealth, one may be gradually forced to descend into the labor pool of relatively unsophisticated and unrewarding labor. The modern dilemma is what this book will attempt to solve. I hope that I will show how to build lasting and straightforward wealth in a world where fundamental changes are now underway. Wealth generates culture. Wealth yields freedom. Freedom yields leisure, spare time. Spare time yields self-actualization and personal growth. Personal growth yields social contributions. And social contributions produce culture. The suppression of wealth. I have been privileged to experience the oppressive conditions that prevailed in Eastern Europe before the breakup of the Soviet bloc. I have personally witnessed under what poor conditions people live, governed by communist regimes, which aim to destroy people's religions and their values in the eastern states of Europe and communist China. When I visited parts of my family in eastern Germany before and after the wall came down in 1989, I saw run-down cities, gray and abandoned houses, and broken windows. I remember when I visited my Aunt Berta in 1982 in Jena, a small town in communist eastern Germany. She lived at that time in a typical multi-family house. Her bathrooms did not even have a flushing toilet. I could smell the distinct stench of cheap burned coal in every corner of the city. Later, in the 90s, I had met my cousin Jürgen in eastern Germany when he was in his early 30s. He grew up in a country ruled by a communist government, and when he arrived in West Germany, his hunger for wealth was overwhelming. Later in my life, when I immigrated to the United States in the late 90s, I saw a democracy where people are meant to be free and are guided by their strong moral values. They could trade and build wealth under the influence of this ethical conduct. However, since then, a lot has changed. I have witnessed that commercial advertisements and political power have undermined virtues. Today, it seems that we overly promote negative traits. Have you watched scenes on TV commercials where people envy their neighbors for having the latest products like a new car? Have you seen the ads that promote greed, lust, or other excessive behaviors? Vices seem to have become more acceptable in our lives today, even though we know that many of these negative character traits are not good for us. How can we keep our vices under control? Religions are one way to learn and teach basic morals. However, commonly accepted morals today have little to do with religion. Morals are the fundamental values for any wealthy society. They are known as the seven virtues, which are in contrast to the seven vices known as the seven deadly sins. The formula for wealth. For the purposes of this book, let's agree to stick to the following seven virtues, diligence, patience, kindness, humility, temperance, abstinence, and gratitude. 
Every one of us has the tendency to respect at least some of these virtues in one way or the other. But we are also often victims of our own greed, lust, excess, pride, envy, wrath and sloth. I believe it is not hard to argue that a person who can balance the seven virtues and the seven vices will more likely succeed in life than someone obsessed with one or more of the seven virtues and vices. I picture the virtues and vices pinned on a steering wheel of a big old ship. When the ship follows a straight course on the ocean waters, the ship holds its course, and it will reach its destination. The upper part of the steering wheel is illustrated by the virtues. The lower part is filled with all the bad habits, the vices. Of course, the ship has to be maneuvered, so the steering wheel has to be turned. At some point, some vices will appear above the sea line. They will appear on the surface. And some virtues will disappear under the sea line. We live on earth and sacrifices have to be made sometimes, in the end, it is not a perfect world. We all are prone to some of the vices at some point or the other. So, I created the Wheel of Wealth trademark. For me, it is a compass that shows me the way to my integrity and, as I will describe later, ultimately to wealth. If I had known the Wheel of Wealth when I was younger, I would have done many things very differently. I would have had different friends, I would have seen their human weaknesses earlier, and I could have tried to guide them or look for other friends. I realize that many of my family members and friends have been and still are obsessed with all kinds of vices, but also virtues. I lost a close person years ago to the excessive overuse of alcohol and many other drugs. I lost another to his destructive political thoughts and activities related to obsessive national pride. I have lost two others to their obsessive dedication to music. I have lost a very close friend to his addiction to extreme sports, and I have lost a very good early friend to excessive greed for financial success. My friends and family. Luckily, the majority of my friends and family are excellent moral stewards. But I have lost my obsessed friends because their obsessions made them blind. I lost some of them because they have been behind bars for quite some time due to their bad habits. I have lost some friends because they lost their license to drive a car or their right to travel internationally, so they could not visit me. All of these friends are very poor today. Sure, some of them get by somehow but many of them live from welfare and others. They have minimal access to financial resources, and their obsessions increasingly limit their world. I hardly talk to any of them anymore, in many cases, I got pulled into their negativity and obsessions very quickly, so I have started to avoid them altogether. I realize that our human weaknesses and strengths are the ones that guide us through our lives. They are like the directions on a compass. All of us are prone to all sorts of behaviors. And I realize that some of us tend to focus on habits that make us weaker while others focus on activities that make us stronger. Furthermore, obsessions magnify certain human behaviors. Like a compass needle points to the north, people's passions point them in a specific direction. Every one of us has a personal north. It is the direction in which our destiny seems to push us towards. What's more, I believe, if the path is towards the human weaknesses, that person will become weaker and more impoverished. If the course is towards human strengths, he or she will become wealthier. It appears to me like a secret formula for wealth. I have seen people who are kind, diligent, patient, humble, temperate, give rather than take and exercise abstinence become generally wealthier than people who live in lust, greed, excess, pride, envy, wrath, and sloth. I have seen, with my own eyes, repeatedly how wealthy people have financial, human, and social capital, whereas poor people are economic and social liabilities. Of course, some wealthy people might be standoffish and even immoral. For example, some individuals today might believe that it was very shameless that John D. Rockefeller became so ultra-rich by selling these unbelievable amounts of crude oil to us, which are said to cause environmental issues today. And we indeed can find exceptions for completely immoral people who became rich and famous. I have also seen people who were angel-like individuals, but never accumulated any wealth. However, I believe that people who can control their virtues and vices will become wealthier than individuals who can't. Are our generations getting wealthier? Today, our contemporary society seems to make us more and more greedy. TV and social media ads show us how to increase our desire for one or another product. 
Companies want us to consume more than is good for us, to make us overly prideful for what we can buy or own, and to make us covet our neighbor's possessions. These character traits combined tend to loosen the control of our temper and make us downright lazier. I will go so far as to say that watching too many ads will make us inevitably more miserable. Of course, all commercial ads are made to promote products created by people who want to make money. Commercials are generally not designed to make the people who watch the commercials richer. There is nothing wrong with that. Except, if you wish to become wealthy, just ceasing to watch ads will not help. So, what will help? When the code of interpersonal behavior, which is considered right or acceptable in a particular society, is suppressed or even destroyed, that society will, sooner or later, end up in poverty. There are many recent examples of countries that drowned in corruption while their citizens became dirt poor. Recently, I watched a show entitled Is Greed Good on Fox News for Business. I was shocked by the arguments of the participants. Everybody seemed to assume that greed could be a part of regular business practice to make money instead of asking at what point greed will destroy a business. I believe greed is only in the way of getting wealthy. Greed is an intense and selfish desire for individual wealth. But building generational wealth has other motives, motives like virtues, kindness, and charity. To maximize generational wealth, individuals must minimize greed. My conclusion is that people must learn and grow up with strong morals if they want to become wealthy. It is clear to me that people need a solid moral foundation to prosper. I believe when people's morals are suppressed, they will tend to become poor. Morals are the basis for wealth. Morals lay the ground for our education and all our actions. Without morals, education is just manipulation, so activism without moral grounds will ultimately lead to poverty and tyranny. When people lose their morals, they will slide into poverty. To build wealth for generations, we first need to teach our children morals. Is being poor as a state of mind? Entrepreneur and investor Robert Kiyosaki says, Broke is when you run out of money, poor is a state of mind. Here is how my seven-year-old son responded to this statement. I asked him if he thinks that a rich man is poor when he loses all his money. Instantly, he replied no, he will do the same things he did when he got rich, and then he will have all his money back. His answer to me was remarkable because he replied so quickly and because his response triggered an exciting thought in me that has kept me busy. My son instinctively implied that being rich is not about having money, he said being rich means knowing how to make money. Later that day, I asked myself if a poor man would be considered rich when he suddenly owns millions of dollars. The answer must also be no, because he will do the same things he did when he got poor, and then he will have no money again. Wealth is a matter of habits. So, my conclusion is that becoming wealthy must be a matter of education and habits. Many generations have worked hard to become wealthy, but only a few were able to do so. During my research on this subject, I discovered a master plan behind why so many people do not become wealthy. Our society teaches too few of us to become wealthy. In this book, we will see why this has been so for so many generations. Today, each generation tries to create its very own form of wealth. Almost everybody in each generation, except a tiny number of elite individuals has failed miserably in all generations. Do you know any family which can live exclusively from the returns of their financial assets? Generations of Wealth Over the last 150 years, the missionary generation, 1860-1882, the lost generation, 1883-1900, the greatest generation, 1901-1924, the Silent Generation, 1925 to 1942, the Baby Boomers, 1943 to 1960, Generation X, 1961 to 1980, and the Millennials are known as Generation Y and Internet Generation, 1981 to 2000, have each had their challenges and hopes. Individuals of Generation Z, the people born after the year 2000, are in college age now. They will be the first generation with a significant advantage due to the never-seen ease of access to knowledge and tools, the new generations, Generation Z, has the potential to finally break through the paradigm that keeps us from creating financial assets for generations. In this book, I will try to explain how to build practical wealth for generations.
It will show us why we need to get out of our comfort zones and create wealth. We will be encouraged to rethink our entire past and future career and reevaluate our financial habits. The book will show us through practical examples of why it is essential to create financial products in our lives instead of only buying financial products. This book will tell us how exactly we can do that. I have gone through nearly all of the scenarios described in this book. I envision it as a complete guide to converting our lives from average, credit-burdened individuals to team-building, sophisticated, influential investors who can create wealth for generations. Family Values With all the knowledge and habits but no concept for family values, we cannot build generational wealth. Mormon families, for example, strive to continue to exist as families after earthly death, and they live with the expectation that they will live again with their ancestors and their eventual descendants. This is why family values are the cornerstone of Mormon families. Roles, responsibilities, and behavioral expectations are taught in every detail. Thank you for listening to the Kitsap Publishing Deep Dive Podcast. Emily Waters and I will see you in the next episode. Stay tuned.